The next type of breath sound is ronchi. Ronchi is caused by having secretions up in the larger airways. It's up in the larger airways. So we're going to hear it up here, which means early in the respiratory cycle. There's a lot of air movement past that secretion, so these things will be loud. Now, one of the disadvantages of having a lot of air movement past that secretion is it's going to dry the secretion out. So one of the interventions we want to do for this patient who has ronchi is we're going to want to make sure that they're adequately hydrated, so we're hydrating that secretion. To hydrate secretions, we first hydrate the patient, then we hydrate the air, and lastly, we would give a mucolytic, which draws that fluid into the secretion itself. But if there's no fluid to draw, then the mucolytic's not going to work, it's not going to help. So we need to hydrate the patient or hydrate the air first. Okay, so again, we'd anticipate with our rock guide that we're going to hear this early in the respiratory cycle. It's going to bubble throughout inspiration, throughout expiration, and it's going to be loud. So let's listen to some rock guide. that bubbling throughout the inspiratory cycle and throughout expiration. Okay, now a similar kind of a sound is a pleural friction rub. Pleural friction rubs are caused by the patient having an inflammation in that pleural space. So the pleural space is the space between the chest wall and the lung. And there's just a little bit of a space in there that contains some fluid that keeps the lung from rubbing up against the chest wall. Now if that space becomes inflamed, then we can end up having kind of a sticky substance in there rather than a nice lubrication. And so it starts to stick. Now when a patient takes a breath in, we kind of break away from that sticky stuff and it creates this noise. Now when you listen to the noise, you're going to hear it sounds very much like bronchi. Okay, so let's listen to it first and then we'll talk about how to distinguish it from bronchi. One of the characteristics that distinguishes it from bronchi is it's drier. Okay, so it's going to sound like bronchi, but it sounds like a drier sound. And in fact, some people talk about it in terms of like crackling old leather. So imagine taking an old piece of leather and bending it and the crackling sound it would make. So let's listen to this. symmetrical that sound is. <coughs> See how that sounds a lot more symmetrical than the rock I did? The rock I was just kind of random bubbling. But that's more of a symmetrical sound. In addition, if we want to try and differentiate this from ronchi, so you're listening to this on your patient, you say, I don't know, that could be a friction rub, that could be ronchi, I don't know. Right? Ronchi is going to be louder over the trachea because it's in the airways. A pleural friction rub will be louder over the chest wall because it's here in the pleural space. Okay, so listen over the chest wall, listen over the trachea, which one is louder? That will help you to differentiate if it's ronchi or a pleural friction rub. Some additional monitoring we can do with our respiratory patient includes monitoring the respiratory rate and rhythm. Now remember again, if your patient has CLPD, 
we put that patient on supplemental oxygen, what's the worry? What's the danger with putting the patient on supplemental oxygen? We're concerned that the patient may stop breathing, right? Okay, so how do you monitor for that? Monitor the respiratory rate and rhythm. Pulse oximetry. Remember that pulse oximetry is peripheral. It's out here. So it's an estimation of what's going on central. But in our patients who have peripheral vascular disease, et cetera, we may have problems with pulse oximetry. If a patient has a respiratory problem, we need to get a blood gas. If your patient has a respiratory problem, we need to get a blood gas. That is the definitive treatment. That is the definitive diagnostic test. The pulse ox is a monitoring tool. Okay, think about this in a different term. If your patient's having a myocardial infarction, we don't just put them on telemetry. We get a 12 lead EKG. That's the diagnostic tool. Then we put them on telemetry to monitor them. That's what we do here. Blood gas is the diagnostic tool. Pulse ox is the monitoring tool. There's lots of problems with pulse oximetry. First of all, it's a light. And if there's extra light in the room, especially outside light, that interferes with the pulse ox and it won't read as well. Peripheral vascular disease interferes with the pulse ox. Pulse ox reads everything that's bound to hemoglobin, including carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, and other things. So we get the blood gas first, then we use the pulse ox to validate and to monitor. So we need that blood gas first. PO2 FiO2 ratio is something we can do off of our blood gas. We take our PO2, we divide it by the FiO2, and it should be greater than 300. So we have our PO2, we divide it by the FiO2, should be greater than 300. What this tells us about is the alveolar capillary membrane the alveolar capillary membrane and whether or not the alveolar capillary membrane is intact. If fluid is starting to build up in that alveolar capillary membrane, our PO2 FO2 ratio goes down. Okay, so, but again, you need to have a blood gas so that you can tell this. Lastly, there's other laboratory data we're gonna to wanna to monitor in our respiratory patient, specifically the H and H, because we want that patient not to be anemic, right? But also our electrolytes because especially phosphorus, can have a real impact on your patient's respiratory system.